is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an infinite line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 265, The Chronovisor, read by Steve Peterson. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, your future may have already happened. An elderly man, with a fringe of short white hair, dressed in a well-worn rumpled suit, was waiting for me when I arrived at the office. Not yet having my morning jolt of caffeine, and with the prospect of having to deal with this unexpected interruption before anything else, I was in a less than amicable mood. The constable at the front was kind enough to let me in, the man explained apologetically before I said anything. The officer also advised me it would be best if I bought you a coffee. He pointed to a steaming takeout cup from my favorite cafe near the station. So, my mood improved somewhat as I took off my coat and settled into my chair, reaching for the cup. He waited while I luxuriated in my first sip. Let me introduce myself, he said after I put the paper cup down. I am Leonardo Moretti, and up to last year I was a physicist at the International Center for Theoretical Physics near Trieste. I am currently pursuing private research. So what brings you to the Polizia di Stato, Mr. Moretti? I asked, hoping this wouldn't take too long. If this is about someone stealing an idea, you should have gone to the Guardia di Finanza. The Polizia doesn't deal with intellectual property theft. No, no, it's nothing like that, Leonardo assured. The Polizia di Stato investigates crimes, correct? So you're here to report a crime then, I suggested, taking a long sip of my espresso, trying not to show my impatience. It was going to be a busy day. There had been a series of robberies which needed to be solved, and I had limited time to process the cases. I'm here to report my murder, he said, like he was talking about a stolen mailbox. Come again, I requested in surprise. My murder. I will be murdered next week. Wednesday at 3.05 p.m., to be precise. It might appear to be an accident, but I can assure you it is not. And how do you know this? I asked, beginning to suspect the man may have a paranoid delusional disorder. Because I saw it on the chronovisor, he claimed. But the chronovisor only lets you see into the past, and unless the Vatican has changed its policy recently, the general public is prohibited from using it, I pointed out, getting a bit annoyed. I didn't have time to listen to crazy stories. It had been less than two decades since the Vatican had even admitted such a device existed. Prior to that, the chronovisor had been a fanciful rumor started by a Benedictine priest and scholar named Pellegrino Ernetti. Ernetti had even recanted the story before his death at the end of the previous century. However, a decade later, the Vatican confirmed it did, in fact, have a machine which saw into the past. It was revealed that Ernetti had apparently worked secretly with Enrico Fermi, Werner von Braun, and ten other anonymous scientists to develop the device in the 1950s. Fearing the machine would be used for great evil, the papacy had hidden the invention in its archives. That was until a new pope decided to allow its limited use by the police to solve the mysterious disappearance of a young woman who was last seen during a tour of St. Peter's Basilica. After that, the Rome police petitioned the Vatican until we were granted ongoing access to the amazing device through a secure remote system built for the purpose. Since then, the work of a detective has been reduced to little more than that of a computer operator. Once the time and location of a crime have been determined, we simply submit a request and receive a video of the criminal literally recorded in the act. Few crimes go unsolved now, and the job takes none of the creative thought it used to. I had to ask the obvious question. How did you get access to the chronovisor? I didn't. I made my own, Moretti proclaimed proudly. It's much improved from the original. There weren't microprocessors and high-resolution video in the 1950s. That's impossible, I protested. The plans for the chronovisor were destroyed decades ago to prevent another one from ever being built. And the papacy almost succeeded, the older man said smugly. But it was impossible for even the Vatican to keep everyone involved silent. I tracked down the granddaughter of a scientist named Eunice Paulescu. 
In one of his papers, Ernetti mentioned he had met Paulescu at a conference and was greatly impressed by her. They shared a fascination with residual electromagnetic radiation. That's how the chronovisor works, he explained. Every event leaves an electromagnetic fingerprint. Paulescu also believed future events sent echoes back in time. They would be weak and hard to detect, but she had proven mathematically that they could exist. Apparently, Ernetti didn't agree with her. He never publicly acknowledged Polescu's true genius, despite the fact she developed most of the theory behind the chronovisor. However, I digress. I sense there was a deeper connection, one which had not been acknowledged by Ernetti. When I approached her granddaughter, she gave me a thumb drive with her correspondence, and from those emails I pieced together the original plans for the Vatican's device. Okay, if true, that would explain how you have access to a machine but the chronovisor only shows the past. So, how could you know about a future event, like your murder? I found a way to implement Polescu's ideas for capturing future echoes, Moretti explained, patiently. Which means, I encouraged, which means my machine can decode the electromagnetic echoes of future events. In fact, I was testing that capacity when I discovered my murder. He said in a demeaning tone as if I should have come to that realization myself. However, as a detective, I have learned to always let the interviewee draw the conclusions. And you are convinced of what you saw on this new improved chronovisor of yours? I asked. Yes, he replied, getting agitated. A car intentionally swerved onto the sidewalk, accelerated and hit me. It wasn't accidental. I can assure you of that. Do you have a video recording? Moretti fumbled in his pocket, pulled out a thumb drive and placed it on my desk. I plugged the device into a port on my computer and a grainy video appeared. It was hard to make out Moretti as he walked through Piazza del Popolo, a popular tourist attraction not far from Vatican City. We watched as a white rental car broke away from the tangled traffic and zoomed past him. A second later, another car moving even faster steered onto the sidewalk and hit him. I had to agree. It looked intentional. Unfortunately, it was impossible to identify the second vehicle. The video quality is not very good, I complained. I know I'm working on improving the resolution, Moretti admitted grudgingly. Future events are substantially harder to capture than ones in the past. Their patterns are less distinct. I leaned back in my chair, thinking, and finally said, There's not much to go on from that video. Do you know who might want you dead? Anyone who doesn't want the future revealed, I guess, Moretti shrugged. How many people have you told about this? You're the only person who knows I've succeeded in seeing the future, he replied. But I've never tried to hide my interest in building an updated chronovisor. Most of my colleagues knew I was working on a design. Have you tried using your machine to look for the location of your colleagues at the time of your death? I asked. No, Moretti admitted, maybe a bit too quickly. A key component burned out. It'll take about three weeks to build a replacement and figure out what went wrong. I sighed with frustration. So what would you have me do, Mr. Moretti? No crime has been committed yet, and you have no idea who might be involved. I... I don't want my death to be seen as an accident, so I figured if I told the police... My computer chimed, informing me there was only 15 minutes before my daily chronovisor session. Unfortunately, I have a lot of cases to process today, Mr. Moretti. I apologized, glad I had an excuse to end the meeting. So I'll need to ask you to leave. If I were you, I'd stay clear of that plaza in the video. Maybe just stay home with your doors locked until the date passes. Sorry, but that's all the advice I can offer unless you can provide me with more specific information. I could tell Moretti wasn't happy with my advice. It doesn't work that way, Detective Rizzo, he explained calmly. You can't avoid the future. So all paths lead to it. How could it be otherwise? Despite what I want to do, there will be a compelling reason for me to end up in that plaza at 3.05 p.m. next Wednesday. I don't believe in a deterministic universe, Mr. Moretti, I said haughtily, silently willing the man to leave. Send me a list of your colleagues and I'll find out what I can, but my advice stands. Stay away from Piazza del Popolo. The older man, stiff from sitting, struggled out of his seat, bade me a good day and left. 
I checked the time. There was only a few minutes to organize the case files on my desk before my session started. A detective inputs the time and place of each felony, then watches the resulting video produced by the chronovisor, adjusting the time and location coordinates until the exact moment and place of the crime is found. After that, facial recognition software identifies the criminal, then an arrest warrant is automatically issued. Disguises don't work because all a detective has to do is backtrack the individual to the point in time they put their mask on. There was no intuition or skill involved. The chronovisor had made the life of a detective routine and boring. Most days I never leave the office except to have lunch. Oddly, as I worked through my pile of case files, my mind kept wandering back to Mr. Moretti's story. The next day, I found an email from the man waiting for me on my office computer, containing a list of his closest associates. My caseload was unusually light, so I decided to use my daily slot on the chronovisor to confirm Moretti's story. The chronovisor is only as good as the information we feed it, and I must humbly admit that I'm one of the best in the department at constructing queries that deliver precise results. However, this was the first time I would use the blessed machine to confirm historical information rather than solve a crime. Pellegrino Ernetti, the machine's principal inventor, famously used it to watch the ancient lost play Thyestes by Roman poet Quintus Ennius, transcribing its scenes for publication shortly after, which would have made him wealthy had the income from sales not gone to the church. With only a list of names, it took most of my day to come up with a query the chronovisor could process. The correct vectors turned out to be five years, two months, and 18 hours ago in Moretti's office at the International Center for Theoretical Physics. A meeting between Moretti and a leading physicist named Dr. Marco Conti, who was on Moretti's list, appeared in the footnotes of a paper on paleoelectromagnetic resonance theory. The process of finding those coordinates happily reminded me of the days before the chronovisor had changed police work forever. Finally, after sending in my request to the Vatican technicians, the machine returned a grainy image of an office with two men sitting across from each other at a desk filled with papers and notebooks. They were engaged in an intense discussion. The following is the pertinent part of that conversation which provided me with the first evidence that someone might have a reason to murder Moretti. I am well aware of the dangers, Marco. That makes me the best person to bring this into the world. The specifics of the design are protected here. Moretti tapped on his temple. I haven't written anything down and I'm not going to. It could be reverse-engineered, Conti pointed out, then threw his arms up in frustration. If you are not going to listen, then you leave me no choice. He got up and left, slamming the door behind him. I have seen thousands of past events through the chronovisor. It's a bit like watching a home movie. The production values are minimal and people's behavior is candid. However, Conti appeared to be overly dramatic and self-conscious, as if he was performing in a community play, overacting to make sure the audience wouldn't misunderstand his message. I made a note to myself about that, then moved on to the handful of other coordinates I had uncovered during my research. Before my chronovisor time had run out, I'd gone through them all finding no other mention of Moretti's plan to build a machine with the ability to see into the future. The next day, I asked him to come and see me. Moretti arrived in the same rumpled clothes he had worn at our first meeting and sat down, fidgeting with his jacket. I found a meeting between you and another scientist named Dr. Marco Conti, I informed him without saying hello. It took place five years ago at that institute you used to work for and Conti appeared to be very upset by your research. The other day you told me you didn't know of anyone who would want you dead. Why didn't you tell me about him, I demanded. The reason I didn't mention Marco was because he died of a heart attack last year, Moretti explained. He was on a cruise and the medics on board couldn't help him. So there's no way to know the exact location, I noted, more to myself than Moretti. That makes it extremely difficult to use the chronovisor to confirm his death. I don't know the exact time either, Moretti added with a nervous twitch. Was he hiding something, I wondered. That's conveniently unfortunate. It means I'll need to confirm his death the old-fashioned way. 
It'll take longer, and we don't have a lot of time to figure this out. I believe the crew stopped in Genoa after he died, if that helps, Moretti volunteered. It does, I acknowledged, feeling that I finally might be getting somewhere. The body would have been repatriated by the Port Authority, so there will be a death certificate. Steepling my fingers, I glared at the man. Now is there anything else I should be aware of? Moretti shook his head. He either didn't know anything more or was hiding something. It was hard to tell which. Why would a man who knew he was about to be murdered not do more to save himself? Then it came to me. You think the future is fixed, don't you? I accused. So there's nothing we can do to stop your murder. I believe the universe contains all events and places that have existed and will exist, he said with resignation. It's called the Block Universe. In it, the past and the future are equally real. But because the Vatican's machine only sees the past, it remains an unproven theory, that is, until I reveal my version of the chronovisor to the world. When we can all see the future, the true nature of the universe will become self-evident. Then why did you bother bringing this to me if you don't believe I can prevent it? Moretti stared at me, and for the first time I saw a flash of anger. To ensure that my assassin will not get away with it, Detective Rizzo, just because I accept my fate does not mean I believe a murderer shouldn't be punished for their crime. No, quite the contrary. I expect you to find whomever it will be and prosecute them to the full extent of the law. Now, if you don't mind, I have many things to arrange and little time to do it. And with that, Moretti got up and left. As I watched his rumpled figure leave my office, I became determined to prove him wrong, to prove the future hasn't already happened. The death certificate wasn't as hard to find as I had expected. Genoa was indeed the first port visited by the ship after Dr. Conti's demise and was where the death had been reported. The cause was listed as a massive heart attack, but my intuition told me to dig deeper. No one had come to identify the body. Instead, the photo in Conti's passport had been used, which was unusual. Passports can be faked. I employed my daily time slot on the chronovisor to record the final disembarkation of that cruise ship in Barcelona. Next, I had the department's AI run facial recognition on all the exiting passengers and got a hit. Conti, perfectly healthy, had walked off the ship. A suspected false death certificate was enough to buy me additional time on the chronovisor, which I used to record the boarding and compare the two. As expected, one person was missing. However, it was a man in his early sixties, the AI identified as Lorenzo Ricci, an accountant from Rome. The evidence was at best circumstantial since exhuming the body would take too long, but if Conti was alive, I quickly sent Moretti an urgent message. He's not dead. Stay away from Piazza del Popolo. It wasn't until the morning of Moretti's supposed murder that I finally caught up to Conti. He had been using Ricci's identity. A CCTV camera at Roma Termini spotted him getting off a train from Latina. Using a department drone, I followed the man as he left the station and made his way down via Marsala to a car rental. The drone, in stealth mode, hovered just out of sight and waited. Conti finally emerged from the rental agency and walked over to a large white Fiat. He looked around, got in and drove off, merging into the afternoon traffic. After the drone switched to pursuit mode, I raced outside and commandeered the closest unmarked police car, determined to stop Conti and prove Moretti wrong. Our actions created the future. We had free will. I needed that to be true. I had just given the car's autopilot instructions to follow the drone when a message from Moretti appeared on my handheld. Heading out to meet with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, Chronovisor Research Director, they sent me an urgent request to talk about my work. I am going to the Vatican to meet them. I read the message, feeling like I was watching a badly written movie where you can predict every move the character will make. You know what day it is? What time it is? I yelled at the device while typing. Are you crazy? Stay home. Delay the meeting. I've been waiting for this opportunity for years. The meeting can't be changed, he immediately messaged back. I knew there would be a reason, and I'm fine with that. Events are unfolding as they should. Remember, this has already happened. His response made me angry. 
I was convinced Moretti was doing this to prove the future could not be changed, to prove his version of the chronovisor confirmed the block universe theory and would win him a posthumous Nobel. A quick view of the map on my handheld confirmed the most direct route for him was through Piazza del Popolo. At least don't go through the plaza, I pleaded in another message which went unanswered. It was as if the two men were trolley cars with broken brakes rolling down opposite sides of a hill toward each other. This was crazy. I had to stop Conti before he arrived at the plaza. Emergency override. Converge on target. Fastest speed authorized. I directed the autopilot and was immediately pushed back into my seat as the car accelerated. The police override gave the AI the ability to take control of other vehicles to clear our way. Cars began to steer off to the side as we sped past stores and pedestrians. We were going to try to cut off Conti before he got to the plaza. The feed from the drone, displayed on the dashboard, showed the rental approaching the place where my car's AI had decided to intercept it, a 5th century gate cut into the old city wall. The rental would have to make a turn and come through that gate before continuing on to the plaza. It was a choke point where traffic slowed, so all we needed to do was block the arch. Out of nowhere, an older delivery van turned off a side street and stalled partway into the next intersection. Its limited autopilot was momentarily confused by my car's attempts to keep it moving, despite the fact it had arrived at its destination. But that was all the delay needed. Conti's rental slipped through the arched gate before we got there. By the time the van decided it was okay to move, we found ourselves forced into a chase along a narrow lane that ran along the inside of the ancient city wall. I tried to take control of Conti's car, but for some reason, it did not respond to the police override. The reason soon became obvious. Having given up on stealth, the drone swooped down and positioned itself near the driver's side window, revealing Conti had disabled the autopilot and was driving manually. As soon as he spotted the drone, he sped up. That close to the plaza, the streets were packed with tourists who began to scatter like pigeons at the sight of the rental car careening wildly down the narrow street. I checked the time. It was just after 3 p.m. and I wished I had placed a tracker on Moretti. Was he in the plaza? Had he heeded my warning and taken a different route? My gut told me he hadn't. There was the squeal of rubber as a tour bus swerved just in time to let Conti pass. But he had been forced to slow down for a moment, which gave us the opportunity to catch up. So we were right behind him as we both slowed to enter Piazza del Popolo. At that moment, my autopilot tried to overtake the rental and force it into the stone wall that ran in a semi-circle around the end of the plaza. However, a group of distracted tourists walked carelessly into the street. Conti swerved and managed to avoid them. Going much faster, we couldn't do the same. The AI only had a few milliseconds to decide. Having been trained on the classic trolley problem, it took the obvious utilitarian solution, six versus one, and swerved to avoid the tourists hitting a rumpled man I had just noticed entering the plaza. The car immediately screeched to a stop and called for an ambulance. I grabbed a medical kit from the glove box and ran back to the crumpled figure lying on the ancient paving stones. In horror, I froze, staring in disbelief. Moretti lay in a growing pool of blood looking like a rag doll thrown out of a moving car. I did my best to help him until two EMTs pushed me out of the way and went to work. Staggering back, still stunned by what had happened, I took my handheld out and found a new message. Thanks for saving us from the tyranny of our future, it said. At first I stared at the screen dumbfounded, then realization dawned. I had been led around by my nose. I knew if I checked with the Vatican there would be no request for a meeting on record. Marco Conti had played us both right from the start. Might there have been a way to prevent this, I wondered? Or was the future already written in stone, as Moretti believed, and we have no choice other than to act out our predetermined roles? For the first time, I wasn't sure.
Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Steve Peterson. Opening and closing themes, composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production and editing by Makeshift Studios. You can support the podcast by heading over to ko-fee.com slash makeshift stories and make a one-time donation to help us offset costs. Or click the support button on our website. You also can help us out by getting your friends to subscribe or follow wherever they listen to audio. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.